Good morning, friends. Welcome, viewers. Uh, this is CEC live lecture series, and uh, we have started a new lecture series now, uh, which will cover what we call world literature. And uh, in the first lecture that was <coughs> given uh, last week, uh, we uh, considered the idea of what world literature is, and uh, the point basically that was made in that lecture was that uh, the term became current only in the 19th century. And uh, even otherwise, considering the reality of the time and life, nothing like world literature would exist before the 19th century. Uh, then, you know, it was emphasized also that world literature comes only when the world has become one, when the world is an entity, when the writer is aware of realities elsewhere than the place where the writer lives. So, because that consciousness, that alertness emerges in human history in the 19th century. So, we could then call it world literature. Before that, as was, as was uh, said in the lecture, uh, Shakespeare was not a world, world literature writer. Greeks were not world literature writers. Chinese writers, Japanese writers, they were not world literature writers because there was no world at that time, the kind of world that exists today. So, in this series, <laughs> we will have a large number of interesting aspects and we will be discussing world literature from different angles. And uh, today's lecture, uh, which is by Dr. Richa Bajaj, who teaches English in Delhi University, uh, uh, Hindu College. And uh, she has written books. She uh, is, is, is a known thinker. She was al already uh, a part of the lecture series that was run previously by the same program. So, we have with us uh, here, and uh, she, uh, her lecture, her, her topic today is 20th century trends and approaches. And she'll be touching upon a few approaches that uh, have emerged in the 20th century, and uh, these are going to help us in understanding and make sense of what is being written the world over by writers belonging to different languages. So, uh, with this uh, beginning, we uh, uh, I request Dr. Bajaj, Richa, uh, uh, Dr. Jay Bajaj, welcome to you, and please give your lecture. Thank you, Dr. Anprakash. Uh, welcome, viewers. Today uh, we discuss. We will discuss uh, the 20th century uh, literary and critical approaches that have come to dominate uh, world literature. The the series, of course, is uh, world literature, and uh, for this reason, you know, it is important to look at the various trends that uh, became important uh, during the period, and in a way. Uh, because uh, un, you know we could bracket we could put texts under these uh, categories now of course we can look at texts as uh, you know belonging to specific nations and countries but we can also look at texts as belonging to different cults and trends and approaches now uh, when we are talking about approaches and literary trends then uh, you know we are looking at particularly uh, the trend of uh, say post colonialism and or uh, you know later on the feminist uh, movements that uh, you know took place in the 20th century along with that we try to look at uh, you know the critical paradigms of deconstruction and post structuralist theories so that um, you know we develop a kind of understanding of these trends vis-a-vis -vis world literature and uh, you know so i'm not going to talk about these trends as uh, you know theoretical units but as um, approaches that we can use and apply and uh, to you know use and apply to understand the text that we'd be discussing in these in this series so uh, uh, you know, when we begin uh, with, uh, you know, the important thing that we need to note about 20th century uh, has been that this particular uh, uh, century has seen decolonization, and that has been an important development in 20th century. Why has it been important? Uh, you know, uh, why is it that uh, you know that decolon? When I mean, what I what do I mean by decolonization? First of all, it is that uh, you know the countries which had been colonized by imperial powers. These countries gain independence, and they, uh, you know, they fight for their rights. They fight, f you know, they, 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 there is a kind of a continued nationalist struggle that goes on in these countries, and then these countries, uh, you know, fight for their rights and finally win freedom from the Western imperialist nations that have ruled them for more than centuries. And you know, to this category, of course, when we think in our own context in in India, we know that you know how uh, the development, how the movements have been fought, the national struggle has taken place and how we gained independence from the British rule. So, that is of course, a kind of a handy example if you have to understand the process of decolonization. Now, uh, 
that is of course what has been true of for us you know the same kind of movements were going on in Africa as well and so you see that kind we can always build these parallels and understand the kind of struggles that would have gone on you know in French colonies in British colonies you know in Dutch colonies so you know how they have how these other countries have tried to emerge and have tried to uh, you know build a kind of uh, their identity a uh, build a kind of an identity which is not dependent on the colonizers identity which is not dependent on the colonizers perspective. Now, post colonialism particularly or post colonial writing you know uh, uh, different kind of um, uh, literature that is available uh, actually brings to focus this kind of colonial perspective that has for long defined uh, the uh, orient or defined the east or for that matter the colonized country. Now, because of this kind of um, uh, coloni because of this kind of colonized perspective, the view is obviously distorted. Why is the view distorted? Because the West has often looked at the East or the colonized nations as, uh, you know, uh, as, as passive reactors. And, you know, while the West in a way becomes a kind of a passive actor, I'm actually using the phrase of Edward Said here, who is uh, known for his book Orientalism and who's, who's uh, you know, he's a leading figure in post-colonial studies who has tried to look at this kind of bias, this kind of inherent bias in Western perceptions of uh, Eastern texts and of Eastern literature. Now, uh, he has talked about this kind of endeavor which, which took place which is called uh, Orientalism and he talks about the limitations of Orientalism, the enterprise itself that is the study of the Orient. Uh, in that in that kind of study you see a kind of a eurocentric approach that in a way uh, you know uh, defines and also tries to describe the uh, orient's experience the east's experience now, when uh, Edward Said talks about that, he actually says that West has, you know, uh, the West has always looked at itself as a kind of a judge and a jury, you know, and and as somebody who's going to, uh, not not somebody, but as a nation, uh, uh, you know, which sits on judgment of the East, who that a nation that decides uh, how to how the East can be portrayed, and in a way, uh, you know, there it there occurs a kind of an essentialization in the process. What do I mean by essentialization or essentialism when we talk about essentialism is that you give a character trait, you give an essential quality to a particular nation, a tribe, a group and then that essential trait, that one trait seems to define it and seems to, uh, you know, it, it, it remains fixed there and uh, for time uh, for times to come it doesn't seem to move so for the west the east is a fixed entity and there is a notion that uh, the writers of the uh, the western world have about the east say for example you know they try to mythicize the idea of the east they call it a spiritual hub they exoticize you know this kind of a world and are uh, you know amused by it but uh, if they had to look for a thinking scientific paradigm here if they had to think about uh, looking at the East genuinely as uh, people who had their own culture and you know uh, and and felt pride in that culture, then that kind of a agency is not provided to the Eastern countries. They are at best, you know, the um, you know a kind of a, the other, the other, uh, you know, uh, is is a word again that uh, Edward Said uses that they, they are the other. They occupy the position of the other. They are not the West. They are not. Yeah, you know the the whites, and so in a way, uh, this kind of um, uh, you know a kind of a uh, discourse is built up uh, around uh, the uh, Eastern world, and this discourse then limits them. It 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 in a way denudes and uh, the humanity of uh, you know a particular culture, or, or you know, uh, or also uh, you know in a way denuding the geography, the the topography of a particular country so you know it's in a way uh, you know relegated to the margin everything else only the perception that the west has of the east is kept in the mind of the uh, western uh, writer so this is uh, but uh, you know i've explained the concept of the orient and as explained by edward said in orientalism and the essentializing of the east but uh, so what is the approach that uh, the writers uh, who are a part of post colonial literature what is the approach that they take? 
Now, to counter this kind of approach of uh, the Western world, the writers, or uh, you know, who write the writers from the East or writers from the colonized post, col uh, the countries that have been colonized and are now decolonized, these writers now write about the experiences of their own country. And so, initially there was a kind of say in the early uh, decades of the 20th century, you know there was a kind of perhaps a kind of admiration among writers who uh, were colonized for the western concepts and western writers. And that was also the case in India, if you think of uh, Bankim Chandra and you think of others you know who wrote in, who started their careers with writing in English, even uh, Michael Madhusudan Dutt. So, all these you know there is a kind of a bent and an inclination and admiration for the uh, West in the beginning or the late 19th century and early 20th century, but post uh, decolonization uh, you know this kind of the with the process of decolonization you see a change in response and reaction. You see that from admiration there is a complete contrast uh, you know and the writers move to reaction you know so they are they are constantly reacting and they are trying to resist uh, this kind of colonial perspective that has for long governed their countries or governed their discourse their culture and has tried to define their culture. So, in order to uh, counter this kind of a colonial uh, you know perception of their own countries, they write alternate histories, they write the country their own um, uh, you know they write about their own nations, about their own culture, about uh, you know a sense of um, uh, you know about the there is, there is sometimes even a kind of a glorification of the past in their writings that you uh, see. But uh, you see the main point that needs to be kept in mind here is that the writers are trying to define their own selves. Uh, in the post colonial writers are trying to define their own selves uh, you know by look by going back to the nation and so there also comes across you know or there comes to the fore a kind of a discourse of nationhood or you know identity the issue of identity the issue of race and hybridity all these then points come uh, you know they emerge uh, because the writers need to, they need to hold on to certain uh, new ideas and which are definitely uh, non western ideas so nationhood becomes a kind of an important criteria for them say uh, chinua achebe he writes you know the, he writes in his novels about these experience even in his essays he critiques the kind of colonial perspective which was offered by um, conrad but uh, you know, so there is a, this kind of a uh, move to define this kind of nationhood and uh, define this kind of identity that the writers are now going to build. So that is one aspect of uh, uh, post-colonial writing. The other aspect is also uh, there. There has been this, uh, you know, uh, this kind of. Um, movement uh, which has uh, which which has taken into account the and the struggles of the uh, the the black population say for example um, uh, franz fanon talks about uh, the black psyche and the impact that the colonial movement the this kind of a colon savagery he calls it a savagery of colonialism uh, you know this kind of savagery of colonialism actually uh, created a deep impact on the black psyche. Now, when Franz Fanon talks about uh, you know black skins, white masks, that is another work of his or when he talks about uh, you know the wretched of the earth, then he is actually talking about the kind of intense struggles that the blacks have to go through uh, you know uh, to, to emerge out of this kind of uh, inferiority complex that has been built in them. And in this process, he says that you know, so his works are mostly around this kind of colonial practice. And you see, Franz Fanon was directly in touch and he saw the Algerian war for independence in the 1950s, and he also saw how it was quashed, it was completely crushed by the French army. And uh, and he then he understood the stakes of uh, you know the of, of the Western world. And in a way, his kind of criticism then tries to bring out you know, tries to bring together the psychological elements with the social and the racial uh, elements that exist uh, you know in uh, among the black population so he's trying to uh, he's trying to actually uh, uh, discover or in fact uncover this kind the layers of uh, you know, or the kind of violence that has been done on the black population because of the process of colonization so you see these are the various uh, you know uh, points that one can look at when one is looking at post colonial uh, approach at the post colonial approach these two writers are seminal in this approach of course there are many other writers and 
I do not, I will not be able to uh, talk about each one of them. But you see, re related is the point of subaltern studies that then comes to the fore, uh, along with post colonial lit, uh, approach and uh, the writers who are writing under this um, paradigm or this discourse. You see, the subalterns, such as um, uh, Gayatri um, Chakrabarti Spivak, talks about, you know, can the, uh, her essay is Can the subaltern speak? Now, uh, th the point is that, you know, there is this idea of the subaltern has come out. Now, of course, there is resistance, there is uh, a kind of a hitting back at the empire and, you know, and, uh, and trying to foster a kind of uh, ethnicity, a kind of racial identity, a kind of nationhood that is there in post-colonial writing. But alongside then, uh, you know, there is, a, uh, there is an emphasis on heterogeneity as well. Now, subaltern studies talks about this kind of hybridity and heterogeneity. It values difference. It says that, you know, uh, well, that's fine that, you know, we are anti-West and the West has done, uh, has silenced, uh, you know, the, the colonized uh, for a very long time. And now it's time for us to speak. But we, when the colonized nations begin to speak and when writers in these nations begin to write about the experiences of uh, the process of colonization and now the process of decolonization and how the new country is being built, then even in this space, there are many subaltern marginalized groups who still do not have a voice. So, you see that now the concerns. So, I think in post colonial literature, there are these two major uh, shifts. You know, one, of course, the immediate uh, point of uh, post colonial um, approach is that they are trying to answer back, they are trying to respond, they are trying to react uh, against and resist the colonial enterprise and also the colonial perspective, the culture that they have tried to impose on West, the western civilization has tried to impose its culture on the east. So, they are trying to hit back and resist, but the second part as you know that phase gets over of uh, reaction, then they move to building a kind of a new ethos and building a kind of new culture. When, the, when we move to this next phase of building a kind of new culture, then there are these subaltern studies that come into being which say that, well, fine, uh, we've, we've said what we had to say about the West. Now, let us look at our own culture and now let us try to define our own culture. And now, when we try to define our culture, we realize, we realize that even within our cultures, things are not the same. It is not that what holds true for you holds true for me as well. I, I have a different um, environment, I have different problems and you cannot understand my problems. Now, when we are to looking at the subalterns, then women occupy that one group. The second perhaps could be the tribals or uh, for that reason, the people who belong to different castes and different groups and backward classes. So, you see these different class and of course, I am taking the example of India again, so that there is a kind of a better understanding. But uh, uh, you see the idea is that there is ethnic, uh, there are ethnic groups all over the world and different ethnic groups are, uh, are constantly contesting, different tribes are constantly contesting with one another. So, you see a kind of a homogenized discourse is no more possible in post-colonial studies as well. Once that first phase of uh, post-colonial literature has uh, done its job of reinventing itself or for that matter, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping its identity away from the West, then the second part of this kind of subaltern approach comes into being. Now, when we are talking about the subaltern approach, particularly women occupy uh, an important place in this group. And here for that reason, uh, as I mentioned Spivak, Sp Spivak actually says that uh, women are doubly oppressed and doubly mar marginalized because, you know, uh, they, they, they have been uh, victim all along uh, through different kind of uh, occupations and colonizations and also the kind of class that they occupy. But they are also women and therefore at home in the domestic sphere as well, they have to go through this kind of oppression. So, this kind of uh, and particularly when we speak of women, then uh, f uh, women movements and uh, women studies uh, become, you know, they are at the center of 20th century, I think, uh, you know, they are uh, they're, they're really the core of 20th century literature or 20th century theory because um, uh, from 1960s onwards, you see a kind of um, a kind of a awareness and a kind of women coming to the fore and writing about concerns uh, that uh, you know concerns of women and also a kind of a feminist movement then builds up during this kind this period 
Now, as we move to feminism or the feminist movement that takes shapes, particularly uh, uh, from 1960s onwards, then uh, you see that uh, fem uh, you know the feminist trends uh, in the world actually have uh, two branches, or I mean, these are not that they uh, you know this is for basically if we can identify two different kinds of branches then one is of course the american uh, feminist and the other is the french feminist now when we are talking about the american feminists then uh, we talk about uh, elaine schwalter adrian rich and susan bordeaux all these people are there and what are the what kind of work are they doing now when we speak of elaine schwalter what is it you see what what is happening in the 20th 20th century is a kind of a century of theory you know so many different approaches trends and theories are coming to the fore so when the world has become a more diverse place and when the question of uh, you know uh, you know the victim speaking up has come to the fore this is the time that women's movement also gains a kind of a uh, philip and at this time feminist studies uh, you know comes to fore now when we are talking about feminist uh, trends or feminist studies then what we are trying to say is that there are certain women certain uh, of course it's all happening in the field of academia and uh, you know these are all intellectual women who have gone through a kind of uh, um, you know an education and now they're trying to build a kind of a canon of uh, women now this is precisely what elaine schwalter does elaine schwalter uh, you know talks about uh, the history of or the literary history of women and you know she says that well uh, you know th this kind of a lit she actually charts this kind of a list literary history through centuries from afra ben and other writers who have been neglected or relegated to the margin and have not found space in mainstream uh, male dominated uh, you know literary canon and so she tries to build a kind of a separate canon for women so that women writers could be assessed and so that there is a kind of a history of women writers in uh, you know in the space of literature now when elaine schwalter is talking about these concepts she actually talks about stages of feminist movements or stages of feminism in which she says that you know the there is a kind of a feminine feminist and female traditions the three stages the feminine being where women actually imitate men and you know they write like them and they want to write like them so that they gain acceptance in the world of the time or the uh, period of the time and to moving towards a kind of a feminist uh, uh, you know phase where they are trying to they are actually uh, you know uh, uh, ridiculing or they are actually trying to point point out the misogynist elements that exist in literature or uh, you know they are they're hitting out and they are protesting uh, in the way literature has been made. So you know the second phase is more of a protest phase and the third phase is the female phase where she says that this is the time when uh, women actually focus on themselves rather than focusing on the other in this case ironically put there it's for so long women have been the other but here in this case that you know she says that well let's look at ourselves and build something out of our own experiences and uh, you know a kind of a new aesthetic and when she talks about this new aesthetic a new model to be built she gives this term which is famously called gynocriticism and a criticism which is female oriented which is uh, women oriented and so this is the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, f uh, feminist movement or this is the kind of uh, uh, you know women's uh, uh, writing that is taking place under the feminist movement in the 20th century so you see this is uh, and along with this as we are talking about the american phase i'll just talk about uh, adrian rich a bit and then maybe later on we can when we return we can speak about the french feminists as well so Adrian Rich is, uh, you know, belongs to like Elaine Schwalter. She believes that, uh, you know, women have been oppressed, and this kind of oppression among women has taken place because, uh, you know, of this direct power that the male has had on the body of a woman. And that's an important concern, you know, that the body of the woman, in a way, this kind of direct control over the body actually facilitates this kind of oppression, uh, um, you know, and, and, you know, so they believe, even Susan Bordeaux takes that approach. But then uh, Adrian Rich, you know, also talks about uh, a kind of a sexual identity, which is imposed on an individual. At this point, <coughs> our viewers, we'll stop because uh, uh, we have uh, made certain points and these points are to be considered further in the second part of the lecture and uh, so far as the first part is concerned two very important approaches have been covered 
uh, one uh, the uh, <coughs> post-colonial approach, the second is, is uh, we are halfway through and we will take it up uh, in, in, in the next part of the discussion. Uh, so far as the post-colonial approach is concerned, uh, the, the point made is about identity, nationhood, experiences of the decolonized and these have you know affected the uh, writing uh, in the 20th century literature and this uh, is born as, as a kind of a mark, as a kind of distinctive mark uh, for the world literature that, that we are discussing. So, uh, we uh, go back, uh, go then to the second part after a short while. So, there is a break. Thank you. Welcome back to the second part of the lecture viewers and uh, we have covered you know two important approaches in the, in the, in the first part and uh, before I request Dr. Jabajaj to uh, resume her lecture, uh, let me uh, make this announcement that we take questions in the last uh, 10 minutes of this series uh, of the series of the lecture and uh, uh, for the questions you can use our toll free number which is 1-800-110-430. I repeat our toll free number is one 800 Double one zero four three zero. You can use this to ask questions, and uh, Dr. Jabajad will be glad to answer and, and respond to the question. So, with this, uh, uh, I request you once again, Dr. Jabajad, to give your lecture, please. Thank <coughs> you, Dr. Anand Prakash. Uh, welcome <coughs> back, viewers. Uh, we were discussing about uh, we were discussing Adrian Rich's uh, works and discussing her within the feminist paradigm. And uh, so, when we uh, look at uh, you know this kind of feminism, then you will find that uh, 
you know so we've spoken about american feminism and within this uh, adrian rich actually brings in and aligns with uh, judith butler and others in her uh, you know and is also uh, comes under the category of queer theory or uh, lesbian or gay literature now you see this kind of uh, and uh, writing or this kind of feminist movement also began at the same time you know uh, in the late uh, 20th century and this is uh, regarding you know talking about alternate sexualities or be, uh, you know a, se uh, a sexual identity which is not uh, uh, necessarily heterosexual and in that respect uh, you know uh, adrian rich actually writes about and you know that's a famous uh, quote and it's a name of a book also it's called compulsory heterosexuality and lesbian existence now when she talks about this uh, aspect then she's uh, you know trying to chart and trying to find make space within the feminist movement for uh, this kind of uh, a group this kind of uh, feminist voice which may not be you know an upper class or a white feminist uh, you know voice and so you know I, again the idea of black feminism comes into being you know how it is different from uh, you know the the reg, you know the the blanketed term that we used as feminism therefore you know sometimes there's a kind of a need to not call it feminism but in the plural as feminisms uh, suggesting that you know there is no one kind of uh, feminism that is uh, you know coming to four in the uh, late 20th century again we are uh, looking at these writers who are you know who are writing around in the 1970s or so now edwin rich in that sense talks about also uh, you know the experience of motherhood suggesting that childbirth and motherhood is a kind you know both these are experiences but at the same time these are institutions that have uh, you know that have in a way um, institutionalized the woman subject and you know have uh, you know uh, necessarily uh, uh, in a way molded how a woman is would act and live out her life so you know individual choice that um, you know uh, that a, that a, uh, that a person may have that a woman may have is denied in this kind of uh, heterosexual kind of uh, uh, you know society is that uh, that have been built for us to live in and so you know her concern is basically to talk about these uh, uh, you know uh, you know in a way uh, all defined kind of uh, existence of motherhood that we talk about and also talk about that as a kind of not just an experience you know uh, but uh, you know but as an institution now when we say that motherhood is a kind of an institution then what are we really suggesting we are we are suggesting that there, it's a kind of a structure that uh, necessarily uh, oppresses women again you know uh, here again when uh, what i said in you know in the before the break that you know how she talks about the body of the woman as the site where violence takes place so you know and where uh, power is administered or in that sense where control actually takes place and so here what elaine schwalter said earlier she actually brings it further and talks about how uh, you know the body goes through a kind of change even during childbirth and again that kind of uh, you know changes in the body also in a way uh, you know in a way uh, control the woman and all uh, you know and in a way direct her into a kind of a life that is that uh, that has been given by society so she doesn't have a choice there so these are the concerns of feminists uh, you know in america or the american feminists who are trying to deal with these situations now as we turn to uh, you know uh, the french feminists who to uh, you know the uh, in france you know what the kind of a impetus that all these movements uh, feminist movements post structuralism deconstruction all these movements took place you know particularly because in 1968 there was this kind of a fierce scene of student rebellion in france it was almost that the students had toppled the uh, you, you know you know the government and you know and uh, i mean their their movement them itself collapsed later but that's a different thing but you know it was all, it was a kind of a state where intellectuals were radicalized where intellectuals became more politicized where intellectuals began to uh, move out of their constraining atmosphere and you know talk about uh, you know victim victimhood talk about uh, you know protest talk about uh, overthrowing the the you know and changing the, the way things have been so you know they they were actually shaking up this kind of status quo and this happened particularly post 1968 now when we are looking at these french feminists uh, uh, like julia christeva or uh, elaine zixou the two of them whom i'm going to talk about a bit uh, uh, today then 
you see what you what is happening is they are just trying to push the boundaries they're trying to it's a kind of a uh, exploration that goes on in their works you know they're uh, all trying to uh, find a way through which a woman's subjectivity a woman's uh, experience can be expressed now of course they find language insufficient now language and subjectivity in women's movements and feminism becomes a very important issue because they realize that language has for so long been male dominated and the uh, and woman has been the other in this kind of a language where you know all the negative references are mostly uh, you know associated with women and the positive ones are with uh, men so you know they you know they and they, they go on to go into the etymology of words and talking about uh, the meanings of words suggesting that you know anything which is uh, weaker humbler uh, or is darker is is associated with woman or the woman's body and uh, you know anything which is bright and uh, you know fierce and you know with strength is, or valor is associated with the male so you see they find language uh, you know ill equipped to handle their experience or, and you know whatever their intent does not get across through a language that is essentially male dominated so that kind of uh, you know language then becomes important for both uh, Elaine Zixu and uh, Julia Kristeva now Kristeva actually talks about in language you know her area she is a psychoanalyst and a feminist writer uh, at the same time a literary theorist as well so you know uh, Kristeva actually talks about uh, uh, these two categories in language you know she is constantly dealing with subjectivity and language in her works so when she talks about these two aspects which are called symbolic and semiotic you know then she's trying to uh, talk about uh, you know the, the 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 you know the use of language in our lives and she says the symbolic language is actually that language which we speak which is systematized there are rules I, I can't just blabber and, and you will not understand so there are rules that we all have to follow but in following these rules in following the system of idea we are being uh, you know we are being imprisoned by its structure we are being imprisoned by its logic and so she says that for women uh, we need to uh, call out we need to bring out what she calls a semiotic language and this semiotic is you know uh, and she calls it uh, the semiotic cora now Cora of course is a word that she's taken from Plato and she says you know Cora she uses Cora actually to um, suggest a kind of rupture in language she says you know that the semiotic has to break out break free from the symbolic systematization of language like uh, uh, symbolic is what we use but semiotic has to find its way push its boundaries break through the uh, the symbolic language I don't know how much I'm clear about semiotic and symbolic, but the idea what Kristeva is, uh, you know, pr uh, projecting here is that language is not sufficient to uh, the language at, as it exists is not sufficient to portray women's experiences, and that we need a kind of an alternate channel of expression, which could be, uh, which is found in flashes in language. You know, suddenly you're able to burst uh, and you're able to say and say much through that flash. And then you have to return to the systematic order of language. So, uh, you know, Kristeva talks about that and her women's time, her essay is all about bringing a kind of, a, you know, bringing psychology, uh, uh, feminism and uh, the social context together, you know, and talk about a woman's time and talk about a woman's language. So, these are the concerns of Kristeva. Now, as we move to uh, Ellen Zixu, uh, we note that uh, again she is talking about writing. Now, writing and becomes a very important uh, point in French uh, theories of French criticism and in French discourses. Whether they are, you know, whether we we are talking about feminism or we talk about deconstruction and post-structuralism later. Now, uh, the point is that. Um, uh, that uh, that Zixu talks about uh, this kind of um, writing the self. She says, you know, uh, that women need to write themselves. That they need to put. They also need to, uh, you know, put themselves in the text. And if I could just quote from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Helen Zixu from coming to writing she says woman must write herself and also at the same time you know when she says woman must put herself in the text now what does she mean by woman must put herself in the text 
you see uh, the text becomes very important in uh, 20th century uh, uh, you know approaches uh, particularly these trends that we are looking at why it, because the text in a way becomes this fertile place where uh, you know expression can con uh, continuously take place now, uh, you know, uh, Ellen Zixu is very particularly, she says that what has been taken away from us, she says that, that you know, we have been uh, wrenched away from our bodies and we have been wrenched away from writing, we have been thrown out of writing, we need to return and reclaim both our bodies and our, and the domain of writing. We, so, women need to enter the space of writing, enter the space of expression, experiment and explore at the same time how best to do it. And she is also constantly doing that. Sometimes Helen Zixu is seen as a kind of a figure, you know, contradictory in terms. But the point is that she is constantly exploring ideas. She is constantly, ex, you know, finding ways of uh, expressing, you know, uh, a woman's experience. So, that is something that, uh, you know, she keeps doing and the important word in Ellen Zixu is, uh, you know, the word that she uses is ecriture feminine. Now, when she says ecriture feminine, uh, it is called, it is basically ecriture is writing and feminine is the woman. So, writing the woman. Now, the word ecriture becomes important again because it is about writing. And this is the point that you know this is the this is where I would actually like to introduce also uh, deconstruction and post structuralism because they are all uh, focused on the idea of textuality or writing. Now, when we are talking about textuality in the context of uh, deconstruction and uh, post structuralism, you will note that even Derrida talks about uh, uh, you know how language is ill equipped, how language itself is not it, it lags or uh, it lacks actually uh, in uh, conveying meaning in the sense that there is there is a lag, there is a discrepancy between the sign the the sign that you use and the, uh, what the meaning what you intend to say what the meaning is so if th there is always a discrepancy and you know uh, there was there was this idea that uh, you know speech is more immediate it is it is it is more truthful it is it is uh, it is it, it is logos and truth and uh, more immediate and has presence while writing is uh, you know away from uh, meaning or ri um, writing is away from truth or it it is actually absent that defines writing. What Derrida seems to say is, uh, I, I do not know if even that is clear what I mean by speech and writing. The idea is that when you think something, when you have an idea and as you speak, then uh, there is some level of truth, some level of um, logo, some center, some presence there. But as soon as you go on to write it on the page, then that meaning is lost because of language itself, because language comes in the way of your intent and your meaning and creates hurdles. And so, what you write on the page is actually, uh, you know, away from reality. It is actually not what you actually meant or what you actually uh, thought. So, that is the kind of a, uh, you know, that is the kind of a difference that it creates. It, 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 the meaning is deferred, that is delayed. It keeps on, uh, you know, it, you keep trying to say what you want to say, but you have never not been able to reach the truth. So, Derrida says actually that, you know, since uh, after Plato, you find that there has been a continual search for a fundamental truth in life, you know, tr people trying to actually in search of truth and trying to say what the truth is, but it is a kind, it has always been a kind of a deferral activity. So, this kind of fundamental search for truth is what Derrida calls logocentricism. So, logos, the logos at the center and where is the truth or the center is trying to, you know, trying to find a center and he constantly says that that's, uh, that approach is entirely uh, erroneous. We need to not have, not look for a fundamental truth, but look at many variations of truths that uh, appear simultaneously and for perhaps a brief period of time and tomorrow you will have another set of truths. So, you know, it is a kind of a multiplicity, it is a kind of a multiplicity of truths and not just one fundamental truth that he focuses on. And he says that uh, criticism has so far, uh, you know, looked at, or philosophy, in fact, has so far looked at binaries and, uh, you know, uh, binaries of light and dark, of uh, presence and absence. So, you know, where the second one is always the other or the, the not desirable element. So, he talks about these binaries and he says how we need to shift away from them. Again, the idea of ecriture and textuality is the same. That 
and that being that you know language is ill-equipped and that language is not sufficient to convey your thoughts while feminists were talking about how language is disabling them to talk about a woman's experience and has been male dominated Derrida actually takes it to say that well all language speech and writing both now Derrida says that speech also is not as truthful as it was thought you know he says even in speech uh, you know there has been some discrepancy has taken place L writing of course is uh, you know is 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 flawed but even speech is not truthful even speech has its own problems so you cannot trust even the speech so you see this kind of uh, uh, understanding of textuality this kind of flourishing of meaning comes into uh, f comes into uh, being in the uh, late 20th century and Related to the, uh, this idea of Derrida is, uh, you know, the idea in post-structuralism about the uh, the pleasure principle of, uh, you know, of of meaning. And here, of course, uh, you know, one thinks of Roland Barthes, who is uh, talked about, uh, you know, talking about the pleasurable activity that takes place in interpreting a text. And he says that play is the thing. And in fact, he's he's one of, uh, you know, he's one of the pioneers to call uh, it a kind of a death of the author. Now, what does it mean to say the death of the author? I'll I'll come back to that because here it gets connected with Foucault as well. But uh, you know what uh, uh, Roland Barthes says is that text is play and text is pleasure, and he says that text is a process, while work is a kind of a product. Now, uh, theorists at this point in time, uh, you know, uh, stop calling a piece of work a, a work. In fact, they start calling it a text. Now, you know, his uh, work is in Roland Barthes has written from work to text. So, that is the title of his work and uh, when, when he says that, what does it really mean? He says that, you know, work is a kind of a fixed entity, it is a kind of a finished product which is made available to us by an author whom we presume to have lived in a particular phase and life and etc. And so, we try to gain meaning on uh, about the text through that author and you know that text is a kind of a finished product. Here of course, he says that well uh, Roland Bad says that that is not true, a, a text comes to life only when the reader approaches it. He says that uh, the work is actually a finished product, but that is uh, that's history uh, from now on we will not call any creative work uh, or any creative piece a work, we will call it a text because it has a, because a text is a kind of a process that means it is constantly meaning is constantly getting generated meaning is not inbuilt has not been coded by the author it is this meaning is in decoding. And of course, this gives rise to another kind of uh, theory that comes to the fore, which is the reception reader response theory and reception theory. So, that is a different thing that is that's further offshoots of these different movements of post structuralism that you see. But what Roland Barthes is trying to say is that he is again focusing on textuality of a, uh, of a particular uh, you know piece a creative piece. Now, he says that you know every text then needs to uh, you know that he says work is consumed while text is produced. So, a work is consumed by the person who reads it, but a text is produced by the person who reads it. The one who is reading is producing meaning. So, again multiplicity of meanings, again various meanings, various truths not limiting oneself to one authorial truth or one authorial presence. So, here in fact when uh, you know uh, Roland Barthes talks about the death of the author, it gets connected with what Michel Foucault, another important um, post structuralist talks about uh, what is an author. Again his essay what is an author outlines this a similar idea that the author is no more a who entity, he has become a what, it is a function, the author is more of a function than a person who is going to uh, give meaning to the text. And so, you see the category of the author then the biography of the author, the person the author was then is relegated to the margin and what comes into being is a kind of free play of meaning uh, that we see here. Uh, at this point, I would actually like uh, Dr. Anand Prakash to make a few points on this idea of post structuralism and uh, deconstruction that has and the multiplicity of meaning that has actually overtaken our lives and what does he have to say of on it, whether it is a positive movement or um, in a way a kind of a negative approach. It is a difficult question you pose because <coughs> uh, you know uh, deconstruction uh, is one of the latest uh, phenomena. Uh, in the 20th century uh, literary thought and uh, the emphasis is on language and the language that is there on the page or the language that as a cluster of sounds is produced by the speaker. 
and uh, uh, Dr. Bajaj, you have rightly uh, pointed out the difference as well as similarities between the spoken word and the written word. The spoken word is immediate, uh, it is a response to the available reality as you have pointed out and uh, so far as uh, written word is concerned, written word you are there on the page, there, there is no person in front of you and therefore, when you are, are, are writing something on the page, you are uh, actually referring to another word on the page that you might have read, that, that might occur to you in your mind. So, in a way as you rightly say, uh, the, the meaning is deferred when you write, Mean meaning is uh, to take place only later. Uh, these uh, particularly this uh, uh, movement of uh, 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 language centric activity in literature and uh, where you know interpretation is more important uh, than you know the, the uh, work of the author, uh, the, the way he meant it or she meant it uh, to be. Uh, this is a question that we are uh, you know focusing in the classes every day. When I teach a text, when you teach a text in the class, when you are in front of the students, then you are doing both. You maybe you are using the blackboard and writing there. At the same time, you are also looking at the students. And uh, we are moving in and out of language. We are moving in and out of the, the, the text all the time as teachers. And teachers, we are creators of meaning as you have said towards the end of the discussion. We, we produce the text when we teach. The student, when the student reads the text aloud or uh, uh, to oneself, that also is creating uh, that, that, that uh, text again. So, I believe that it is very enriching, it is very exciting uh, as an activity uh, in which you know uh, writing, reading, uh, communicating with others becomes important. And in fact, you have very rightly given a kind of basis for thought uh, for the existence of language, for the existence of literature uh, that is enshrined in the language. So, uh, it is a very exciting point uh, one makes and uh, uh, I was thinking all the time as you are uh, making these very important points of the argument of world literature today. Because all the arguments that we are giving uh, viewers, uh, um, uh, Dr. Bajaj is doing it today, I will be doing it the next time and there will be a third speaker also who will be doing it. All of us are presenting this as a background against which you know world literature is to be understood. World literature believes in unity the whole world is one, the whole world is in, uh, uh, indivisible and uh, we are giving the background of the 20th century thought where individuality is lost, where, where, where uh, 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 unity is lost and individuality is asserted. So, we are talking about identity whereas, world literature will talk about the commonness of our pursuits. So, uh, it is going to be a very exciting experience and uh, I would, in fact, I would like uh, uh, you to respond to this idea that this background uh, actually compels us to think in the opposite direction. This background tells us that all, all literatures are distinct and separate and honest expressions of their own word, their own ideas, etc. We are saying in this series that all these literatures in their, in, in their uh, you know, um, variety, in, in their distinctness are actually going towards oneness of, of all the human experience. So, uh, it is going to be very exciting uh, viewers that you know, you, you look at the same thing from two different angles and uh, world literature is a formation, uh, emphasizes unity emphasize those points in, in, in human experience which bring them together and when they can fight certain forces that do not allow them to be get uh, to, to, to get together. So, uh, I would like you to uh, slightly throw light on this distinctness of world literature from this, this thing. Just, just uh, uh, you, you could maybe conclude with this idea and uh, if you have no questions then you can we can utilize this time for you know going into this aspect. So, please respond. So, <coughs> in terms of world literature of course then you know, I, I, I do not know, uh, you know, how to talk about world literatures in terms of these theories, because uh, it is not like the literature is actually adhering using these principles to, uh, you know, uh, say what they have to say in their literary works. But uh, these ideas are to be kept in mind as a kind of a uh, thought of the century. You know, I think uh, that is the important point. I mean, one may not find a text, a literary text representing deconstruction or, you know, actually projecting post structuralism in that sense. It could be a feminist text, yes, of course, a post colonial text, but then, you know, the text has its own truth or the text has its own, uh, uh, you know, in you know, inner uh, logic or its inner. Uh, uh, you know experience or the inner culture that it is trying to portray. So, uh, I think uh, we need to look at it as a kind of a, a map that is out there for us to, uh, it is a kind of a mental map of the century if I could call it. I can, I can you know construct this question this way, you talked about uh, American feminism, you talked about French feminism and uh, well there could be also Indian feminism. Do not you think that this idea of feminism can bring uh, all women of the world together today in the form of world literature? 
it can but at the same time you see this emphasis on heterogeneity and identity which mm -hmm. comes into being and you know that my truth is there your truth is there so all truths are there but i you know that they don't reach a kind of a uniformity because there is this kind of emphasis on that one cult or one tradition one trend that one is following uh, you know even when we are talking about post colonialism then even there there is the negative movement or the black uh, you know the uh, the culture movement. Uh, so you see these uh, problems of uh, so while uh, on one hand these groups are enabling, they also in a way disable you to uh, merge your identity with another group. So that that kind of a uh, you know that kind of an uneasy relationship always remains, where one is one is a feminist but one doesn't want to be called a blanketed term feminist but you know look at oneself as an Indian feminist or a kind of a uh, or say a queer theory feminist or you know even post structuralist feminist like uh, Judith Butler you know. Uh, the, the, the point I am making is that uh, in a way uh, the uh, post colonial and other approaches that we have discussed today suggest that uh, humanity in terms of experience can never become one would, would, would you agree with that? What uh, humanity? humanity uh, because of th uh, such approaches can never become one in the world. No, that is the point that it, it humanity is one to begin with mm. uh, because we are all humans. Mm. I mean that one basic fact if we don't lose sight of mm. and then we take on the identities which are there around us, mm. you know and after that whether we are capable of uh, you know whether we are confident enough and capable enough to uh, align ourselves with a larger uh, you know globalized human humanitarian viewpoint or an international sort of a uh, humanism. I was coming to this as aspect very mm. rightly you, you, you have gone, gone in the direction. Are there nations or is there also internationalism? Yeah, uh, today I think this kind of a preservation or protection of the nation is there and protectionism is the new word that we see. But uh, I think uh, now in a way preserving the nation I is a kind of a cry because the world is increasingly moving towards internationalism. Inevitably, historically it is moving towards internationalism which is why I think this, uh, this there is this urge to bring it back into this kind of uh, preserving mode. Well, viewers, uh, <coughs> with the uh, last words that come from Dr. Chabajaj, tell us that uh, we are moving towards internationalism in spite of the fact that humanity today, today is divided uh, into different nations and uh, that is the positive note and that is the note, you know, that uh, uh, world literature as a concept addresses. Thank you and uh, we will meet again to discuss further the, the text and the trends in world literature. <laughs>